Students, welcome to this, my last conceptual lecture covering nuclear chemistry. In today's lecture, I'm going to teach you about nuclear fusion and where babies come from. Are you ready? Let's get started. So nuclear fusion is the process of fusing together lighter weight atoms to form heavier ones. This process gives off even more energy than nuclear fission that we talked about in our last lecture. Nuclear fusion is the process that fuels our sun through the following set of reactions that you're welcome to pause here and look at more closely if you wish. Nuclear fusion is an attractive potential source for energy production because light elements such as hydrogen and helium shown here are very abundant. And nuclear fusion produces little if any radioactive byproducts, which contrasts with nuclear fission where you have to start with polonium and uranium and stuff like that. The problem with nuclear fusion is that it requires very high temperatures in excess of 40 million kelvins to get started. On Earth, such temperatures have only been achieved by detonating thermonuclear or hydrogen bombs. But you might ask, what about cold fusion? Well, according to Wikipedia, cold fusion is a hypothetical type of nuclear reaction that would occur at or near room temperature compared with temperatures in the millions of degrees that is required for hot fusion. It was proposed to explain reports of anomalously high energy generation under certain specific laboratory conditions. It has been rejected by the mainstream scientific community because the original experimental results could not be replicated consistently and reliably, and because there is no accepted theoretical model of cold fusion. Cold fusion gained worldwide media attention after reports in 1989 by the University of Utah's Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann, then one of the world's leading electrochemists, that their apparatus had produced anomalous heat, excess heat, of a magnitude they asserted would defy explanation except in terms of nuclear processes. They further reported measuring small amounts of nuclear reaction byproducts, including neutrons and tritium. The small tabletop experiment involved electrolysis of heavy water, or D2O, on the surface of palladium electrode. The reported results received wide media attention and raised hopes of a cheap and abundant source of energy. Many scientists tried to replicate the experiment with the few details available. Hopes fell with the large number of negative replications, the withdrawal of many positive replications, the discovery of flaws and sources of experimental error in the original experiment, and finally the discovery that Fleischmann and Pons had not actually detected nuclear reaction byproducts. So Fleischmann and Pons went from being briefly very, very famous and very cool and cutting edge to being slightly infamous and probably a little bit of laughing stocks. We'll now read a few paragraphs under the cold fusion heading at Wikipedia's article linked to right here, just because I think it's interesting. Martin Fleischmann was a British chemist noted for his work in electrochemistry. Premature announcement of his cold fusion research with Stanley Pons regarding excess heat in heavy water led to their names being identified with the frenzy, controversy, and backlash that followed, although they continued their interest and in research in cold fusion. Fleischmann confided to Stanley Pons that he might have found what he believed to be a way to create nuclear fusion at room temperatures. From 1983 to 1989, he and Pons spent $100,000 in self-funded experiments at the University of Utah. Fleischmann wanted to publish it first in an obscure journal and had already spoken with a team that was doing similar work in a different university for a joint publication. The details have not surfaced, but it would seem that the University of Utah wanted to establish priority over the discovery and its patents by making a public announcement before the publication. In an interview with 60 Minutes on 19th of April 2009, Fleischmann said that the public announcement was the university's idea and that he regretted doing it. The decision would later cause heavy criticism against Fleischmann and Pons being perceived as a breach of how science is usually communicated to other scientists. I have to interject here and say that for those of us who are professors and those of you who may become professors, please make sure that you learn the lesson from this experience, that you should never listen to your administrators. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding, but we'll go on. On the 23rd of March, 1989, it was finally announced at a press conference as a sustained nuclear fusion reaction, which was quickly labeled by the press as cold fusion, a result previously thought to be unattainable. On 26th of March, just three days later, Fleischmann warned on the Wall Street Journal report not to try replications until a published paper was available two weeks later in Journal of Electroanalytical Chemistry, but that did not stop hundreds of scientists who had already started work at their laboratories the moment they heard the news on March 23rd. And more often than not, they failed to reproduce the effects. Those who failed to reproduce the claim attacked the pair for fraudulent, sloppy, and unethical work, incomplete, unreproducible, and inaccurate results, and erroneous interpretations. When the paper was finally published, both electrochemists and physicists called it sloppy and uninformative, and it was said that had Fleischmann and Pons waited for the publication of their paper, most of the trouble would have been avoided because scientists would not have gone so far in trying to test their work. 
Fleischmann and Pond sued an Italian journalist who had published very harsh criticisms against them, but the judge rejected it, saying that criticisms were appropriate given the scientist's behavior, the lack of evidence since the first announcement, and the lack of interest shown by the scientific community, and that they were an expression of the journalist's right of reporting. Fleischmann, Pons, and the researchers who believed that they had replicated the effect remain convinced that the effect is real, but the general scientific community remains skeptical. Here's a very recent article, or a link to one, from the magazine Popular Science, or as the online cartoon character Strong Bad would call it, Nerdular Nerdance. I think that it deserves some attention, so I'm going to read a few excerpt passages from it right now. According to this article, fusion power could happen sooner than you think. In a presentation that seems ripped from the atomic age, Lockheed Skunk Works says that it might be a decade away from producing a power plant based on compact fusion reactors. Unlike current nuclear reactors, all of which use fission, nuclear fusion does not easily produce materials that can be used in nuclear weapons. Fusion reactors also offer better containment, easier shutoff, greater energy efficiency, and less radioactive waste than their fissioning cousins. Of course, with something this promising, there has to be a catch. Despite the fact that nuclear fusion has been pursued as a power source since the 1950s, fusion reactors have yet to be effectively turned into a regular power source. Tokamax, the first kind of fusion reactor attempted, generated power by using magnets to squeeze and heat plasma in a giant ring. To make it work, you need a massive donut-shaped vacuum chamber, and it can take years to go from construction to power generation. There has been something of a modern revival of fusion reactor attempts, but most designs still are tremendous undertakings requiring the kind of resources and infrastructure that usually only governments can provide. And such coordination efforts are difficult in the best of times and can be an impossible sell during severe financial constraints. So in part, it's the feasibility of the new Lockheed project that makes it so compelling. Much smaller than traditional fusion attempts, the compact fusion reactor uses a cylinder, not a ring, which makes for a stronger magnetic containment field and leaves fewer points where the energy could escape. This could make for a reactor that's small enough for a truck to transport and still robust enough to generate power for 100,000 homes. Lockheed hopes to have a test model available by 2017 and scale up to regular production by 2022. Now, in spite of how cool and uh, potentially world-changing this sounds, I hasten to point out that Popular Science is a magazine focused on extremely cutting-edge research that borders on science fiction, much of which never really ever comes true. So, much like reports of us getting a mall or a Chili's restaurant in my small rural hometown community, I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> that takes us to the end of this lecture and the end of this chapter. Please stay tuned to our next chapter videos, which I'll post shortly, in which I'll begin teaching you about organic chemistry and biochemistry, the chemistries of living systems. Until next time, my wonderful students, have an enjoyable rest of your day.